Hey everybody, welcome back to another Foundations in Faith. As we continue walking through those foundational beliefs of what it means to be Christian, what it means to be Lutheran. Normally I say something about the Apology, the Augsburg Confession, or the Catechisms, or something along those lines. Um, but as we turn to our topic today, there really isn't much debate, at least at the time that those documents were written, about what's going on in our topic for today. As we take a look at communion, as we take a look at the Lord's Supper, or what we would call the Sacraments of the Altar. So I'm going to stay away a little bit from the Book of Concord, uh, the Apology of Augsburg Confession, the Catechisms and all that. We'll get into it next week. Uh, this is already going to be a two-part video at least as we talk about this subject. But today I just kind of want to give you a very 10,000-foot overview. What is communion? What do we believe in communion? And then next week we'll dive in a little bit deeper into the controversies that were happening at that time, yes, um, but that still happen within our church today and why we practice the way that we do as we come to the altar, as we come to partake of Christ's body and blood. And so as I say that, uh, that is the first point that I want to make, that this is a sacrament. This is something that brings about the forgiveness of sins in our lives. If you remember a couple of weeks ago as we were talking about baptism, we gave those three things that are required for something to be considered a sacrament. It has to be instituted by God, it has to bring about the forgiveness of sins, and it has to be joined to some physical substance here in this world. And as we take a look at communion, the Lord's Supper, we see all of these conditions are met. It is instituted by God actually in all four Gospels, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 11 speaks about communion as well and when it was instituted. And these are the famous words of Jesus, take and eat, this is my body, take and eat, or take and drink, this is my blood given for you for the forgiveness of sins. So we see right there the second portion of what's required for a sacrament. The forgiveness of sins is directly tied to communion. And then the third piece is that uh, as Jesus was sitting there at the Last Supper, he took bread, the scriptures tell us, and that he broke the bread. And as he distributed the bread, he said these things. And then it was after supper that he took the cup and he gave them the cup that was full of wine and said these things as well. So we see that the promise, the, the power, the word of God is joined to the bread and the wine to be Christ's body and blood that are present within communion. Before we dive into that theology a little bit, I just want to give you some background of what communion was before Jesus, uh, before he instituted this new covenant. And this really harkens back to and it plays off of the history of Israel, especially in the time of the Exodus. So if you remember way back in Exodus, the early chapters of Exodus, Israel at that time is in slavery to Egypt. They're in slavery under the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. And so God calls Moses out of the desert, calls, calls his servant to deliver Israel, to deliver his people. And you remember that Pharaoh and Moses, they got into uh, butting of heads. It was really God against the gods of Egypt. And God, Yahweh, as he pronounced himself at that time, um, was showing his superiority over the gods of Egypt. And as he does this, he brings ten plagues upon Egypt as a punishment of their sins, yes, as a punishment of Pharaoh's hardness of heart, um, but also as showing his superiority over those gods of Egypt. That last plague, then, is the angel of death that would kill the firstborn of every family that didn't meet the requirements that God sets forth. So if you remember those requirements, it was that uh, the Passover meal was taken. This is when the Passover meal was instituted that each family in Israel would, would sacrifice a lamb, a pure spotless lamb. They would spread the blood of that lamb over the doorpost of their house. When the angel saw that there was the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of the house, they would pass over that house and no one within that house would be sacrificed. So we see Israel in slavery to Egypt. We see God punishing the sins of Pharaoh, but preserving and delivering Israel through the blood spread on the doorframe. And as they go from there, they go to Mount Sinai, and they enter into a new covenant with God, that original, that first covenant. This is very similar, it really is a foreshadowing of what happens in communion for us. As we are in slavery, not to Egypt, but to sin. I believe we talked about this last week as we talked about baptism, that we were in slavery to sin. We need someone to come and deliver us, which is exactly what God does through Jesus Christ. God's judgment on sin, his wrath over sin, the punishment for sin, is poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross. As he takes our place on the cross, as he pays that price on the cross, we are preserved, we are delivered then through the shedding of his blood, through the life that he gave on the cross. And from there, as we partake of Christ's body and blood, as we enter into baptismal life, 
we are now in a new covenant, so the covenant in the blood of Christ rather than in the blood of sacrifices. So the blood of lambs, plural, has been replaced by the blood of the lamb, the lamb of God. That's the covenant, the grace that we now live in. So that's kind of a, a quick history of Passover to now the Lord's Supper to communion. And as we see the words of institution, again, they are present in all four Gospels. And I, I'm going to give you those references really quickly so you can look them up if you'd like to. Um, those are in Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, Luke chapter 22, John chapter 13. Uh, and then again, Paul speaks about it in Corinthians chapter 11 as he's instructing the early church on communion and what communion means. And that's really where we're going to spend our time in 1 Corinthians next week as we talk about communion and the different issues that arise with it. Um, but for now, it's enough. For this week, it's enough to simply look at those words and say that these define our understanding of communion. These define our understanding of what it means, of what's happening within communion. So as Christ takes the bread, as he breaks the bread and he gives it to his disciples, he says, this is my body. And as he gives them that cup, he gives them that wine, he says, this is my blood for the specific purpose, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now we take Christ's words at face value there. When he says, this is my body, this is my blood, he very easily could have said something along the lines of, this symbolizes my body, this symbolizes my blood, or let this remind you of my body and my blood. Uh, that's not what he says. He says in a very literal way, this is my body, this is my blood. So we take Christ at face value and say that, that what's actually happening within communion is in a way that we don't understand, in a way that we could never understand, Christ has joined himself and is physically present in the bread and in the wine as the words of institution, that promise is spoken over that bread and wine. And so we would say we believe, teach, and confess that communion is not symbolic. It's not just a remembrance, but rather that Christ's body and blood are present in, with, and under the wine. Again, in a way that we can't really understand. It's a mystery to us, and yet it's a beautiful mystery, the promise of the forgiveness that is there. The bread and the wine, they're not effective by themselves. So in the same way that um, we don't use special holy water for baptism, we just fill it up from the tap, it's rather the power of God's word and his promise joined with the water that makes it effective. Same thing with communion. Bread and wine by themselves are nothing special. It can be any kind of bread, it can be any kind of wine. Um, it's not the bread and the wine, rather it's the promise and the power of God's word spoken over, spoken into the bread and the wine that Christ has attached himself to that makes them effective, that brings about that forgiveness of sins. So Christ is present in, with, and under the bread and the wine. He is physically, bodily present. It is his body and his blood that we eat and that we drink that brings about the forgiveness of our sins. But also, along with the forgiveness of sins, it brings about the strengthening of our faith. That's a beautiful promise that we speak as we distribute the Lord's Supper every week uh, when we're able to up front. As we give you the bread and as we give you the wine, take and eat. This is my body, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of your faith into life everlasting. As we come to the altar, as we come to that rail, as we partake of communion of the Lord's Supper, we hear again of the forgiveness that's freely given to us. We hear again of the forgiveness that Christ poured out on the cross. Much more than just hearing it, we can actually taste it. We can touch it. We can smell it. We can feel it as that bread is in our hands, as that wine is in our tongues. It's this beautiful reminder, this beautiful strengthening of the faith that we've been given, that Christ has forgiven us, that he continues to forgive us. Even today, in the midst of everything going on, we have Christ's forgiveness and his promise of that forgiveness. So a good way to look at it, maybe, um, something that we can think about, is that baptism is a once-for-all declaration of God's love and forgiveness. At the time you are baptized, you are changed. You are given new life. You are given eternal life. You are given a new identity, as we said last week. You're a baptismal identity, now as a child of God, in the family of God. But it's a once-and-for-all declaration. Whereas communion is a constant reminder of that new identity a constant reminder of that forgiveness and a constant reminder of the promise of the forgiveness of sins that Christ has won for you. In the same way that uh, if you get married and you go to the altar and you speak your love to your spouse and you make that declaration 
and you make those vows and you are married from that time forward. But if you were to go from there and never say to your spouse, I love you, you might begin to question your, your faith in that marriage might begin to fade just a little bit. In the same way, we come to um, the sacraments and we say baptism is sort of like that marriage at the altar. It's that first once and for all declaration, that changing of identity. But then communion, coming to the altar weekly, is when you go to your spouse and you say, hey, I love you. And you tell them again, I love you. And you tell them time after time and day after day and week after week. You continue to strengthen that bond, that relationship, that love as you speak that into their lives. In the same way, our faith is strengthened time and time and time again as we hear and receive that forgiveness in communion each week when we come to the altar. A beautiful part of communion is that it also unifies the body of Christ. And what I mean by that is communion is meant for Christians. In the very, very early church, as they practiced communion, even people who were coming to church um, who hadn't officially been put on the roster is what we would say today, but hadn't officially joined the church, they would have kind of two parts of service. They would have the normal part that everybody was welcome to, where there was the reading of scripture, usually a sermon by the pastor, some kind of discussion in that way. But then everyone who wasn't a member of that church, everyone who wasn't within the formal church, was asked to leave as the people gathered together and then celebrated communion. It was the second portion, kind of a, an after the first service, second service, because communion is meant for the body of Christ. Communion is meant for people who are already in Christ, who have been baptized, who have that faith and that forgiveness of sins, who have that salvation, and who are now coming together as the body of Christ to partake of communion. Now, this isn't... A hateful thing. This isn't an exclusive thing. Um, and we'll talk about this again next week as we dive into 1 Corinthians and what that has to tell us about communion. Um, but we ask that non-Christians refrain from partaking out of Christian love. And again, we'll get into that next week. Um, but suffice to say for this week that it is a way that Christ draws his body together, that Christ unifies his body as one and then sends us forth from his church, renewed, refreshed, strengthened in our faith. This is a short video this week, um, but that's all right. We have a lot to cover next week, so it'll be a little bit longer of a video uh, as we talk about the different controversies within communion, the different discussions that happen and take place. Until then, uh, have a happy 4th. Today is the 2nd of July, and so when I'm recording this, so I hope you have a happy 4th celebration. I hope you have a safe weekend in the midst of uh, the pandemic, the coronavirus, everything going on, that you're able to celebrate with your families, you're able to come together and worship and I will see you next week as we continue talking about the Lord's Supper. Have a great one, guys.